Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, Lunch Hour Lectures at UCL. My name is John Martin, and I'm Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine. Uh, but today I'm introducing Professor Wendy Carlin, who's going to give today's lecture, Can the Eurozone Crisis Be Solved? Now, Wendy Carlin is Professor of Economics here at University College, uh, and her research is mostly into macroeconomics. And I learned that she's an expert, a member of the expert advisory panel of the UK's Office for Budgetary Responsibility. So she clearly doesn't only have an academic role, but she has a role that might affect the future of us and our country. So, Wendy Carlin. Thank you very much. So this is the topic of today's lecture, can the Eurozone crisis be solved? Those of you who know anything about economists will know that you won't get an answer to the question, but nevertheless, I hope there'll be something of interest um, to take away. So the first, the, the first question we can ask is, how long is there to save the euro? And as usual, Google provides us with the answer to this question. Um, and here I've plotted the data according to how many days to save the euro, weeks or months. And you can see that there's a peak here uh, in terms of weeks to save the euro, which was associated with something Mario Monti said. George Soros, a little bit earlier last year in June, gets 130,000 hits around that time. And George Osborne even makes it with, with talking about six weeks to save the euro. Um, the, the first of these real kind of spikes was uh, s centered on the Irish crisis in November 2010 with two days to save the euro. So this was it, which I think is a, a really fantastic photo, 48 hours to save the euro. So what I want to do in the talk is two things. I first of all want to talk about why uh, the panic has gone away. So if I ran that uh, Google thing now, you get very few hits saying, you know, one week, two months, three months. So the panic has dissipated, and I want to give a, a kind of account of why that's happened. And then in the second half of the talk, I want to talk about the division between the north and the south in Europe, and why, in my view, the crisis will be protracted, even if the proximate cause of the panic has been resolved. So I'm going to talk about the panic and then about the crisis. So the panic has, has gone away. And uh, probably the best way of thinking about this is to look at the cost of borrowing by governments in the Eurozone as compared with the German government. So this is a very good uh, indicator of, of what was driving those headlines in terms of how many weeks or months to save the euro. Um, and what, I, and what I'm going to do is to just show you some data. First of all, looking at the period before the Eurozone was formed, then looking at the Eurozone, the kind of the glory days of the Eurozone uh, before the, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, when things started to go wrong, and then thirdly, after some decisive statements by the ECB. So this, is, th th this shows you the data, and what I'm plotting here is the difference between the cost of borrowing by each, each of the governments. I've just got a selection of, uh, of Eurozone countries up here. So it's how much does it cost them to borrow to finance the gap between their spending and their revenue as compared with the baseline, which is always going to be Germany. Okay, so it's the so-called spread against the German borrowing rate. So uh, the data here starts in 1990. This is the period up to 1999, so the 1999 is cut in half there. That's when the euro starts. And you can see that for, for this group of countries, they did have to pay more to borrow uh, uh, in, in terms of selling 10-year bonds. They had to pay more than the Germans did. And the, the basic explanation for this was that before the euro, eurozone started, there was some risk that the national currencies would depreciate um, in, in the period coming up to to the formation of the Eurozone. So it's what we would call exchange rate risk that really accounts for those spreads in this period here. Here, 
is the, the, the Eurozone period, uh, 1999, up to the point where Lehman Brothers collapses. And you can see that the, those spreads just collapse. They, they simply disappear. And it's, it's just as cheap, even for Greece, which, which jo joined the Eurozone in 2001, once it's in there, uh, it becomes as cheap for the Greek government to borrow virtually as, as for the German government. So what, how, do, how do we understand this? Well, it's, it's sort of blindingly obvious that comparing it with the first period, where there was the possibility of exchange rate changes. Exchange rate risk has vanished because all of these countries are using the same currency, the euro. So the only gap that there can be between the cost of borrowing for one of these countries and the Germans has got to do with the risk that that particular government won't pay back on its, on its borrowing. So it's so-called sovereign default risk. And there wasn't any. Okay, it's gone. There isn't any. And nobody talked about it in the first period. That was just seen as exchange rate risk. After the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, the picture gets exciting once again, and we have this opening up of really big uh, differences in the, the cost of borrowing for these different countries, with Greece being the most extreme. Now, in this period, we, we're still in in the Eurozone, these countries are still using the Euro, so there's no exchange rate risk. So what's being reflected here is the idea that these governments may not honor their obligations in terms of their long-term bonds. So this is the appearance of sovereign default risk among a group of advanced economies. And this is really quite dramatic development. I've got a close-up here, just starting from January 2007 up to the present, and just picking out Spain, Italy, and the UK's in there for, for, for comparison. And you can see the, the big spikes up there. Uh, they were kind of overshadowed by the Greek drama in the previous slide, but you can see them very clearly compared with what, what, what was going on in the UK. And the, the point at the end of the slide here shows uh, this very important statement by the president of the ECB, Draghi, on the 26th of July last, last year, the so-called whatever it takes statement. And then you see these spreads coming down. Okay, there was a second statement which seems to uh, uh, reinforce the end of panic, the sort of se severe panic phase, which was the ECB's uh, statement on the 6th of September with the so-called OMT, uh, outright monetary transactions, which, which is what it was called, where the ECB explained the circumstances under which it would buy government bonds. I just want to point out one more thing using these data, which is to draw the comparison between Spain and the UK. Both of these countries have serious public debt problems. In, in fact, the UK's was considerably more serious than the Spanish for most of this period. And yet, it's only Spain that was attacked by the so-called bond vigilantes. You can see it. See the red line. The Spanish had to pay much more to borrow to finance their deficit than, than the British. So why is that? Both countries apparently have a serious debt problem. Well, the answer to that helps to explain the importance of Mario Draghi's statement in July last year and, uh, and, and the end of panic. So the, the, the answer centers on the point that Spain is in the Eurozone and the UK is not. So what? Well, it actually matters a lot. Spain has no central bank of its own able to buy its government debt. In extremists, the UK does. It has the Bank of England. Okay, so the, it turns out that the monetary arrangements are very important for, for explaining those uh, big interest rate spreads facing governments and why there was a sovereign, uh, sovereign uh, default crisis, a panic in Spain and not in the UK. 
And what Draghi's statement did was to resolve some uncertainty about government, governance arrangements in the Eurozone. So let me try and explain what I mean by governance arrangements and be a bit more uh, precise about this. So what I mean relates to four different groups, citizens, the government, the central bank, and the banking system. So citizens pay taxes, they hold their savings in banks, they vote for governments, and they trust the money backed by the central bank. The government issues debt, prevents bank insolvency from destabilizing the economy. How does it do that? By using tax revenue from its citizens and by issuing debt. The central bank issues money. It prevents bank illiquidity from destabilizing the economy because at the end of the day, it can buy government bonds by printing money. So that's what a central bank can do. And the banking system relies on the central bank and the government when stressed, okay, when stressed either in terms of liquidity, when depositors are trying to take out their, their deposits, and even a, a, a perfectly solvent bank is faced with, with a crisis. So solving that problem is the responsibility of the central bank. If, on the other hand, the bank has a problem of solvency so that its liabilities exceed the value of its assets, then it's the government with access to taxpayer revenue that has to step in and resolve the solvency crisis of banks. So the government and the central bank interact with the commercial banking system in two different ways. So what's all this got to do with, with the, the euro? One more step. So this, this just shows the relationship among these, these four actors in, in a nation state. So we've got these commercial banks here linked through solvency to the government, and behind the government stands the citizen or the taxpayer. And then coming down in the bottom route is the uh, link between the commercial banks and the central bank. And crucially, in this, uh, this governance structure, there's this blue arrow that links the government and the central bank. And what I've referred to that is, is, is in terms of the reciprocal stabilization of the central bank and the government. So there's this joint production of confidence in the economy that uh, relies on the relationship between the, the government and the central bank. And the central bank is the lender of last resort to, to both the government and to the banking system. So that's how it works in the nation state. Now let's compare that with... Uh, the governance structure in, in the Eurozone, what we could think of as a problematic governance structure. So here we've got citizens of member countries. So the red are the member countries, the individual countries in the Eurozone, and the blue is the supranational Eurozone. And you can see just by looking at the colours that there's kind of a mixture of these things. Okay, so that citizens belong to member countries, governments belong to member countries, the central bank is at the supranational level, and the banking system is this a mixture, including the complications created by cross-border banking. So this is the equivalent picture for sketching the, the governance structure in the Eurozone, in the pre-crisis Eurozone, as compared with, with the, the case in the nation state. And you can see by looking at it, it, it looks more complicated, and there are these thick black lines. So the thick black lines on the left-hand side have next to them no bailout. So in the pre-crisis governance structure of the Euro Eurozone, there was no mechanism supposed to be in existence that would allow one member government to step in and bail out another member government, which was facing um, a problem of solvency. Okay? And then we have the two, uh, the double um, black line at the bottom, which creates a separation between the governments and the central bank. And you can see that in the box at the bottom, it says European Central Bank, lender of last resort to the banking system, providing liquidity, but there's nothing in that box that says anything about lender of last resort to the government. And in fact, it's the two black lines that produce that separation. So let's, with that in mind, let's uh, return to Draghi's speech of the 26th of July, 
where he said, the only way out of this present crisis is to have more Europe, not less. A Europe that's founded on four building blocks. A fiscal union, a financial or, as it's often referred to, a banking union, an economic union, and a political union. And we can see how those four pieces relate to the governance structure that I've been sketching. This is, the, this is his famous statement. Within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. Okay, so that's, that's the famous statement of Draghi that caused that downward movement in the interest rate spreads. So let's just see how these uh, four elements of the, the, the more Europe rather than less Europe fit into the, uh, the picture that I sketched for you. So ec by economic union, he's referring to somehow mending this relationship between the supranational European Central Bank and the member countries. So that's the first step, the economic union. The banking union is... A, 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 a way of setting up a resolution mechanism that will minimize the possibility of the uh, insolvency problems in the commercial banking system spilling back onto the uh, national governments. Okay, so that's the banking union, and it has to be a union because uh, there are many cross-border banks involved, and many banks are, are large relative to the size of national governments. So think of Ireland, for, for instance. And this is the third bit, the fiscal union, which uh, is, is captured in uh, the implementation, well, the agreement in March last year of the so-called fiscal compact, which is designed to provide a way in which uh, you don't exactly get rid of the no bailout, but you provide a, a, a set of commitments of member governments that will enable in under... Uh, uh, extreme circumstances for there to be support when a member government comes under uh, financial pressure. So that's three of them. But this is the crucial one. He referred to political union amongst these. The only bit of Draghi's speech, was very short, by the way, about one page of A4, the only piece that anyone remembers is that second sentence about doing whatever it takes. This, this section about the four, fiscal union, economic union, banking union and political union is in the, first, in the first paragraph. And all that I want to do here is to emphasize that behind all of this, in terms of creating the reciprocal stabilization between countries and central bank, is some notion ultimately of a taxpayer or of a citizen. And that uh, is something that we should think about when we think about the extent to which uh, we've, we've really got a solution to this problem. So there's some movement towards a more coherent gov governance structure looking a bit more like a nation state uh, as a consequence of what's happened over the last year or so. So uh, I think, well, I, I, I think I've, hopefully I've given you some uh, sense of why the panic has gone away Draghi statement, the ECB's actions have, have been crucial, but that I've perhaps also indicated that cr creating a coherent governance structure is a major policy and political challenge. Okay, so it's a policy challenge because getting all those pieces working properly is actually quite difficult, but at heart, at root, in some sense, it's a political challenge because of that crucial role of the citizen taxpayer that stands behind the, the, the whole way in which the governance structure operates. So who is this European citizen? So I'm going to leave that now, you can ponder on that, and then uh, and, and move to the second part where I want to talk about the division between the north and south of the Eurozone and why I think the crisis will be protracted. The US is a common currency area that works. So what's wrong with the Eurozone? And I'll argue that what's wrong with the Eurozone is that 
uh, well, one way of thinking about it in terms of what happened is that in the first 10 years of its operation, it was characterized by asymmetric behavior, very different behavior between a northern Eurozone, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Finland, and a southern Eurozone, Italy, Spain, Greece, and Portugal. Some countries are missing from here. <coughs> so the good question is, where is France? France is neither really northern nor really southern in ways that you'll, you'll, you'll see. And Ireland is not there either. And Ireland's just different and small, so we can set it aside for the moment. So who, who was engaging in this, these different behaviours? The government, governments in the north and the south, which produced the, the problem that's... Uh, that seems the very short-run problem at the moment, which is a public finance problem, and I'm not going to talk about that. The second group of actors are private sector actors who, who behave very differently, firms and unions, and this lies behind a medium-run competitiveness problem between the North and the South, and then we could say, in some sense, whole societies behave differently, and that produces a longer-run national governance problem, completely different from the architecture problem that I've talked about, first of all. This is something to do with national governments. So the, the, the simple answer to the question of how the US can operate as a perfectly successful, large, common currency area, and the Eurozone can't, my answer to the, to the question is that in the US, there's just one variety of capitalism operating there. But in the Eurozone, there are at least two, and that really matters in a way that I hope I can explain. So what do I mean by these two types of capitalism in operating in, in the Eurozone? It's what characterizes this north-south divide. And the argument is that there's one type of country, the north, which are what can be referred to as coordinated economies, they have large wage setters, important unions, but they operate in such a way that they target the real exchange rate. And what that means, I hope, will become clearer. The point at the moment is to, uh, to convey the idea that there's, there's another group of economies, non-coordinated or uncoordinated economies, also with large wage setters, but the, this lot have large wage setters, fractious unions, that don't work uh, in a coordinated way, and in particular, do not target the real exchange rate. And what this produces is a, a stark division in the way parts of the Eurozone operate. In, in the north, there's a growth model, if you like, based on tradable sector, sometimes talked about as export-led growth. And in the south, there's a model based on domestic growth, or if you like, on non-tradables. Why, if we have these two types of countries, why does the exchange rate regime matter? Why does it matter that they're sharing a common currency? <clears throat> to, to understand this, it's, it's quite useful, I think, just to take a step back and think about what was so attractive to the southern countries about joining the common currency area, about giving away the lira, the franc, etc., and taking on the euro. Well, at the time, it seemed very attractive because it provided countries with weak institutions and uncoordinated unions. It provided them with a German-style central bank that could deliver inflation targeting, a low and stable inflation regime. So that was a reason to join. But the argument I want to make is that's a good reason to join, but if you join and behavior doesn't change, then you are locked in to a very unfortunate uh, monetary arrangement for the following reason. That if, if, you, if there's some kind of shock in, in your economy, okay, just think of a southern economy. So suppose that wages go up, or costs go up in the south, say 5%, and the ECB is targeting an inflation rate of about 2%. Then 
to get back on track, it's not good enough to get your rate of cost growth back down to 2%. You've got to undo the deterioration in your competitiveness that pushed your costs up by 5%. So you've got to go through a period in which your costs grow by less than 2%. And you found it really hard to control inflation, and that's why belonging to the Eurozone was a really good idea. So that should kind of highlight why behavior had to change for the Eurozone to work successfully. Let's think about the North now. Think about Germany. Germany has a weight of 28% in the Eurozone. It operates in a very different way. It has real exchange rate oriented wage setting, which is embedded in the private sector behavior of a whole number of institutions, unions, works councils, employers associations, and uh, operating both in large companies and medium sized companies. This wage setting system is interconnected with a system of training and high skill formation and a, and a particular innovation system. Okay, the, all these things fit together. This defines the sources of German institutional comparative advantage in manufacturing. And what's very important, that goes along as well with uh, fiscal conservatism. Because for this kind of model to work, you want the pressure to be on the private sector to organize itself in order to keep the economy competitive. So you don't want to be in a situation where the government is prepared to step in and support domestic demand. That's the essence of, if you like, uh, an export-oriented model. So here you've got it. These are the cars in the uh, headquarters of Volkswagen in Wolfsburg. And what is interesting is that if we compare 2013 projections with 2000 and the share of world car and truck production, Western Europe's share went down 29%. Germany's share went up 10%. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that small blue bubbles are the, the 2012, and they're all smaller, except in the case of Germany. Did Germany thrive and boom in any obvious way in the first period of the Eurozone before the global financial crisis? The answer is absolutely not. Germany and Italy did worst. In fact, Germany and Italy grew exactly the same amount in the, first, in the period from 1999 to 2007. Okay, they both end up exactly spot on in 2007 taking uh, as 100, 1999. They were both laggards. Were they doing the same thing? Absolutely not. What the second column shows is the growth in productivity. So during this period of very sluggish growth, German productivity was increasing. Uh, Italian productivity was not. And in the third panel here, German wages were growing very sharply, uh, sorry, Italian wages were growing sharply and German wages were not. So even though both countries were laggards in growth terms, something very different was happening inside the economies. Behavior was responding very, very differently to being inside the common currency area. Okay, that's Germany. Its share of car production goes up from 30% to 44% of the, of the European market, and the Italians halves during that period. It's not just Italy, Germany. This same picture holds for the Eurozone North and the Eurozone South. So nominal wage growth was much faster in, in the South, in the left-hand panel, than in the North. Faster wage growth means that you're becoming less competitive. And output per worker or productivity growth was much faster in the north than in the south. So you put those two things together and you get a widening of the competitiveness gap. Let me turn to the third aspect of behavior, that of whole societies, and uh, point to what 
also happened during that phase, that first phase of, of the Eurozone before the global financial crisis. The argument I'm trying to make is that in the North, under this new arrangement of the common currency, the private sector adjusted via coordinated wage setting. But in the South, there was no magical change in behavior, even though Tina was true in some sense. There is no alternative. It didn't have any effect. Okay? Behavior didn't change radically when the rules of the game changed. Given that private, the private sector didn't adjust, then the governance, the ability to govern, matters much more because the burden of having to make sure that the economy does adjust to the new rules of the game falls on the government. Okay, if the private sector is not shouldering that burden. But very strikingly, what happened during this period is that the quality of governance between the north and the south of the Eurozone diverged. So even though we would think, okay, they're now in a common currency area, convergence, 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 it's not what happened. So these are indicators, a number of indicators of the quality of governance. The blue are the north, the red are the south. Governance is higher, was higher at the beginning than in the north and the south, whether it's the presence of the rule of law, the control of corruption, or this one here, the government effectiveness. But what's so striking is that those gaps get bigger during the period of the Eurozone. So under the new rules of the game, when the burden on good governance increased, the uh, ability to meet that challenge diminished. And this shows that this, these are much longer run data with the indicators of economic reform show that convergence is possible and happened before the Eurozone period, right? The lines get closer together in the years, so 1970 to 1999 in the left-hand panel, 1995 to 1999 in the right-hand panel. It's, it's only under the Eurozone that they diverge, okay? So it's not that it's impossible for convergence to take place. Let me move swiftly to the crisis period, the Eurozone crisis period, which really kicks off in 2010. The supranational reforms toward creating more Europe, dealing with the first set of issues that I raised at the beginning, the, those governance issues that lay behind the panic last year. So the economic, fiscal, banking, and political union. I th think, I, I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, Mario Drag Draghi did indeed do enough to deal with the panic. So the panic was eliminated, but the other elements of, of the reforms, the supranational reforms, ha have a depressive effect on growth. There are also a series of national reforms in the South which have, have partly been linked to the willingness of the ECB, but also the implementation of the fiscal pact, right? The, it, it, it's been required that there be national reforms as well. And there's been progress on tax enforcement. <clears throat> there's been a series of labor market reforms in different of the southern economies. But the short run effects of these measures as well are to depress growth. So what we have in the South is deep recession, and high debt burdens. We have weak growth pros prospects, and what I also want to argue is that we have, there's no real prospect of a so-called German locomotive, of the North, led by Germany, stepping in and generating uh, sufficient growth to overcome um, a very deep and long recession, which otherwise looks on the cards for the Eurozone. Before I do that, just let me uh, talk about what progress has been made in terms of overcoming the competitiveness deficit of the South. So what, what these data here show uh, is a measure of competitiveness. So the black line is Germany. So a falling line means improving competitiveness, falling relative costs. So Germany became way more competitive from when the Eurozone started. I showed you 
the, the numbers behind these, this composite earlier on. And Spain and Italy, you can see, go way off with uh, massively deteriorating competitiveness. We then have the crisis, 2008, 2009, and it looks like we're getting some convergence. Okay, Germany becomes much less competitive. But what's that all about? What that was all about was German companies holding on to workers, their skilled workers, in the face of the collapse of orders, in the teeth of the crisis. They held on to their work workers. They weren't making any sales. So as a result, just by arithmetic, output per worker goes down. Productivity goes down. Okay? So that, that real um, inverted U is a consequence of the response of German companies to the crisis of holding on to workers. So once that crisis is gone, you can see that the competitiveness gap re-emerges virtually unchanged. Spain, with unemployment rates of more than 20%, has seen very weak wage growth and improvements in, in productivity. So there's some indication that under the uh, extreme pressure of austerity, there's been an improvement in Spanish competitiveness. Look at Italy. There's an, a, a huge gap that, uh, that shows no signs of closing. So let me uh, suggest reasons why Germany won't stimulate Eurozone growth. So Germany, in fact, has some fiscal space, which means that you could make an argument that they, they could run a more expansionary fiscal policy and delay austerity. That would benefit the south and the north of the eurozone through higher growth. A social planner can see this, right? It just, it, it, it seems a bit, if everyone gains, why can't we agree to do this? But the argument I've tried to sketch is that Germany's political economy requires a competitiveness-oriented private sector combined with restrained fiscal policy. So that doing this is just inconsistent with the way in which that model works. So it's perfectly possible for everyone to see that overall utility and utility in the South and the North would go up in the context of a German locomotive. But it's quite different to suggest that that's going to happen. Okay, so there seem to be very important reasons why it won't. And another way of seeing this is to put the question around this way. Why is improved southern competitiveness via southern wage deflation under the pressure of austerity? Why is getting the south more competitive through lower wage growth there. Why is that different from higher northern wage inflation? Okay, they seem to be the same thing. Okay, the north becomes less competitive because wages go up faster there as compared with the case where the south becomes more competitive because wages don't go up so fast there. In economic terms, the effect on intra-eurozone competitiveness is, is identical. But there's a, a big difference in political economy terms because the German model requires the export sector to retain control of the real exchange rate or of competitiveness. So what is it that sustains the north-south divide? In my view, it's different historically rooted systems of capitalism and their associated institutions that produces a political equilibrium. And it's that political equilibrium that sustains this difference. And there's an Italian election uh, Sunday, Monday, and it would be very interesting to see, um, see the outcome of that. But everything I've read about it suggests that, indeed, there is this very deeply rooted political equilibrium. How much reform will the decisive voter in those southern countries allow? And this is the point at which the economist bows out. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Carlin. Uh, 
really wonderful to see the effect of human beings and different sorts of human beings on economics. Just a time for one question. This gentleman here, just say who, who you are, will you? And I'm, I'm Bruce Westbrook. Has any non-Northern country, one of the Southern sinners, uh, made any successful steps towards becoming a, a better uh, European macroeconomic citizen? Well, if you look at the competitiveness data, then the, the, the most progress, you would say, if you just looked at the numbers, is, is by Spain. Um, and in fact, the Spanish economy is certainly more dynamic than, for example, the Italian economy, where it looks like very little has happened. The problem is that this is happening under a situation of, of an extremely deep recession of uh, unemployment rates, youth unemployment rates of more than 50%. And so the real question is whether a, a kind of really deep transformation of the way in which the economy operates is and can take place. And I, I think that's, that's a much harder question to answer. The answer is no. Thank you very much indeed for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.